Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to introduce you to a new file type that is coming as a built-in feature in every single .NET API template from version 8 onwards and that is the .http file type. Now be very careful, this is not a new thing, it has been around for a long long time and it's actually based on a Visual Studio Code open source extension. But JetBrains Rider, my ID, also had an implementation for it for years and it's something I've been using for the past 3 or 4 years for both my own personal work and my live demos in different conferences and workshops I run around the world. The reason why it's coming as a built-in file now in the .NET API 8 template onwards is that it's finally now supported in Visual Studio as well. So the Visual Studio team has implemented that functionality, but there is a bit of a caveat here which I will be explaining in this video. Now, like I said, this file type has existed for years now. However, we finally have built-in support for it in Visual Studio, which means that the .NET team can actually add it in the template. But they actually missed something in the process and there's a little bit of drama which I will be explaining in this video. If you like that of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe and for more training, check out my courses on domtrain.com. Okay, so let me show you what I have here and how you can get this file as well. I have .NET 8 Preview 6 installed and what I'm going to do is create a new API project. To do that, I'm going to run the command .NET new API and then the output will be called HTTP file example. So I'm going to do that, it's going to run through all the template stuff and then I'm going to get my project created. So I'm going to go to Visual Studio actually and include the project. All right, here we go. So we have an API here. It's basically just a minimal API. So you have a program.cs. It maps some to-do endpoints here and then some class. We don't care about any of that. All we care about is this brand new HTTP file example .http file. And let's see what we have here. We basically have two blocks. We have this block over here and this block over here separated by these three hashtags. And at the very top, we have the setting of a variable. So we say that this variable over here called HTTP file example underscore host address is this. And then we can use this these uh, curly braces to actually use that variable in here. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if I go and I run this API in the background and the API is running now here, if I want to actually call that API, I don't have to open a browser and go to Swagger if Swagger is installed and just click all the buttons. All I have to do is actually go here and say, yeah, run this request. And as you're going to see here, I'm getting the response of that request here. So I'm getting the content, I'm getting everything. Now it's not nicely color coding, which I would actually really like, but you can actually fire those requests. So if I want to say get to do with value one, then I can do that and I'm getting item one. If I want to say item two, then I can do that too. And you can actually extend this even further, even though it's not properly documented or supported in the IntelliSense that we have now in this version of Visual Studio, we also have support for things like parameters. So I can say, for example, dollar sign here and then random int. So generate a random int between one and five. And if I do that and I run this, then as you're going to see, you're going to see one here. And then if I run it again, three, and then if I run it again, four, and if I run it again, then three. So it randomized between the parameters. You can have things like a GUID if you need one. So just put dollar sign and you can use that and so on. Now there's many parameters supported, but you cannot really see them with the current intelligence. But if you want a better supported version of exactly this implementation, which is basically what Microsoft is basing it on, then if you're using Visual Studio Code, you can actually go to extensions and install the REST client, which is the exact same extension that Microsoft based their implementation on. So if I scroll all the way down, this is very well documented. You see the parameters here. So GUID, random GUID, timestamp, date, time, dot environment, uh, AAD token if you need one, support for other things. So you can just copy different parameters and you can move them over. So if you have, for example, a post request, you can do it like this. Just say post at the HTTP uh, version that you want and then maybe some headers. So content type here is a header and then the body. You can use things like user A agent, accept language, and so on. And you can even do things like load files, as you can see over here, or even make GraphQL requests. So these things are supported in the REST client in Visual Studio Code. Now, understand that support will gradually move over to the Visual Studio version. They're not directly using that implementation in Visual Studio. They are effectively trying to copy what this is doing in Visual Studio. The very clear benefit of this is that this can be a file in your file system and just share it with your team. And if you need to have examples on how to call your different endpoints, it's very easy. You can just go here and say, yeah, if you want to generate a token, just click this button, you get the token back. And if you want to do this, then do this. If you want to do this, then do this. And it supports all the standard ways of calling an API and different parameterization approaches. However, we have a bit of an issue. I'm going to go ahead and load the exact same project that was just created in Rider, which by the way, Rider for years 
also has a port for the .htp file and it's something I've been using. So we can see the exact same project in here. I'm going to go ahead and load the box standard, the out of the box HTTP file example .htp file. And here's the problem. Because the .htp file is not a standard file type, there is no specification for it, meaning that the plugin made its own implementation and JetBrains made their own implementation. And it so happens that the variable approach with the at symbol isn't actually supported in the writer implementation, which is something that's very infuriating because from a Microsoft perspective, you just alienate this huge market of writer users that now are stuck with the file out of the box that does not support this way of doing variables because they just happen to use that way. Now, before you say that Microsoft is actually in the right to do that because they make .NET and JetBrains can go suck it, I'm going to counter that by saying that when I complained about this on Twitter a few days ago, uh, Said, which from what I understand is the person implementing the support or at least leading the effort, uh, said that they did not know that this is actually the case, that the add parameter is not supported in the writer implementation and they will be working with JetBrains to actually try to cross-implement those features. You should not be alienated based on what ID you choose to use. It's fine if the two do not support the same feature, what is not fine is the out-of-the-box implementation is just not working on one of the two major IDs here. It's also pretty cool that now we have Microsoft and JetBrains working together for the best of all developers. Uh, and you can call me the matchmaker now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. So what is so different in the JetBrains implementation? Well, one of the things I don't like, and I wish actually the JetBrains implementation was supporting this approach of variables, is that if you want to do the same type of variable thing in here, you'd need to have something like this, where we have this sort of a script block that is specific to this request over here. So it's not a global thing, it's just for this request. And then you can do things like specify variables, specify things like URL, body, uh, header, environment variables, everything here. And then by setting that here, this is actually supported now here, and I could make that request and this parameter would be used. Now, this is not nice compared to the app implementation, the Visual Studio one. However, JetBrains also supports this nice way of environment variable sort of files. So what I can do is I can say new environment variable file here, and I can say that in dev environment, I want this parameter to be HTTPS localhost and whatever it was, I don't quite remember. And if I do that, then I can go here and say select dev and then everything in here is using this parameter. So not only can I check in my HTTP files, but I can also have variables in a single file, which I can share with my team and say that for dev use this, for prod use this and so on, which I actually really like and I wish that was supported in the Visual Studio version. Now, the great thing about the JetBrains implementation is that they actually have support for way more things. For example, yes, you have things like authorization, authentication and so on. And you can set tokens and global parameters, but you can also do things like tests. So I can say client.test for a specific scenario, and I can check into my code base some smoke tests as well about my application. And if I just go ahead and I run this, here we go. So the status was okay. And if I want to see, for example, a test failing, this is supposed to return 404, but I'm saying assert 200. So if I run this, then you're going to see fail test expected 200, but goes 404 and so on. There's tons of things you can do here from WebSocket stuff in the right implementation to yeah, things like this over here, test. You can write JavaScript to have things before or after the request, the use parameters from that request and the response. But I do wish they also had this add simple parameterization here because that would at least make the built-in file compatible with Rider. And from what I understand, we are going to get that. Now, there's some other things that are actually not consistent between the two implementations. For example, it's called GUID in the Visual Studio version, but it's called UUID in the JetBrains one, because remember, JetBrains is using the same platform for all of their IDs, and UUID is a more universal way of calling the GUID v4, which is basically what we have in .NET. And also, if you want to do things like random uh, int, you cannot say 1 um, and 5 as we have in the Visual Studio version, but you can say random integer, and then from 1 to 5, which I also very much like, and it will give you the exact same experience as before. Bottom line is, if you are not already using this HTTP file format, expect it to be coming as a built-in thing now in .NET 8. I think it's a great thing. I think you should actually keep it in your project and expand on it as you are working on it. And I can totally see someone make like a source generator of something that detects your endpoints and generates example requests for your API, maybe as a NuGet package or something like that. That would be very, very helpful. And if you want to take that as a call to action to make it yourself, then please be my guest. I'm not going to be doing it. But now I want to know from you, what do you think about this? And do you like the fact that now we're going to have this sort of inconsistency between the two IDs and should 
one implementation win over the other? Should just both companies talk to each other and implement the same things? I want to know your thoughts. Well, that's all I have for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, keep coding.